Welcome to Now That's Something Good, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary in the everyday ordinary. This is Will, and I have the privilege of sitting in every single episode that we've recorded. I'm the production engineer. I take the show notes. I listen into everything that happens during our episodes. And I have to tell you that today's episode is truly extraordinary. We often get to share with you stories that offer encouragement, that maybe give you some golden nuggets of things you can implement into your life to just receive better and more better things from from your life. And today's episode is no exception to that, but it truly shows you a literally a life changed because of an extraordinary act of kindness. And so I can't wait really to move on and and let you listen in on this episode that Sarah has coming up in just a second. But before I do that, I just want to encourage you If now that something good has meant something to you, if this episode resonates with you, would you do us a favor? Would you rate and review our podcast? And by doing that, you help others learn what now that something good is about and the value that it offers. And again, it's not about Sarah. It's not about me. It's not about our family. We don't do this for any kind of recognition or fame. We really do it to be able to share encouragement to other people and mostly for you as you're listening to know that you're not alone and that you can hear that there are extraordinary things happening in people's lives around you, your neighbors, the person you run into at the gas station or the grocery store, they might have something incredible that's happened in their lives and they just don't always get the chance to, to share about it. And so if you rate and review our podcast, you help others receive the same sort of encouragement that you're getting, hopefully from today's episode. Now, without further ado, let me hand over this episode to my lovely and beautiful wife, Sarah. Enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back. Today in the studio, I'm really excited to have not one guest, but two guests. I have Angie and Nick. Say hello. 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 (laughs) I'm going to give them a chance just to introduce themselves a little bit. So Angie, I'm going to start with you. Just tell us a little bit who you are, your family, your day job, all those kind of things. What do we need to know? about you starting off? Um, I'm Angie, and I'm married to Nathan. We've been married for 26 years. I have uh, three kids and an extra kid. Um, (laughs) I have a 23-year-old son, a 20-year-old son, a 16-year-old daughter, (laughs) um, and a daughter-in-law. So Jay and Liv got married last year. Jeremy's 20, and Josie's 16. I love it. You got a full full crew there. I do, and I love that. (laughs) I bet. We're going to have to come back and talk about... the older kid thing, because I'm living this, we're getting there. And so I feel like I need some advice later, Angie. Yes. <laughs> Nick, tell us about who you are. Hi, I'm Nick Hammer, and my wife is Susan, and we've been married almost 20 years. And we have two children, and Noah and Layton. And okay. on ages, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always horrible it's all right. on those. They're in the teens, once in the car, yeah, 16 and 13. Once in the car. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, I work within uh, special education uh, at elementary school. Awesome. Well, Nick, I feel like we just got to start right off. You were, I think you're a singer. <laughs> Do you sing? No. Uh, <laughs> no. A, a little bit. A little bit? Sometimes. Are you going to sing for us something today? Oh, not right now. Not right Maybe now. Maybe later. Like a jingle. <laughs> do you, are you one of those people that like singing just random? Like, do you sing things just randomly? Like, you'll be talking and things just come out? Or is it. No, it tends to be more things of interest that okay. are like songs that I'm hung up on at the time. Yeah, I love it. Well, we'll have to come back around to that, Nick, and share this. So <laughs> I feel like we're going to learn so much. So Angie, I want to jump back to you. So we've got a pretty important story that we're really going to share. And so we're just going to kind of, but before we get to all of that, just tell us a little more about you're here in the St. Louis area. Um, what is your day job? Did you say that? I didn't. I'm a respiratory therapist, okay. and I have been working at my job for 24 years. Um, it has always grown perfectly with our family to working very little, to working a little bit more than very little. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't usually work very a lot. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I work um, outside the home, and when the kids were little, I was home mostly. That's awesome. So it's been flexible to be able to do yes. both those things. I love it. Where are you originally from? Here in St. Charles. Okay, you grew up. So then it's the classic, right? Everybody dogs on St. Louis. What high school, where are you? What high school did you go to? St. Charles West. Okay. Forever the best. Forever. <laughs> See, she had it down. If you are listening outside of the St. Louis area, there's a joke about being in St. Louis. That as soon as you say you're from St. Louis, everybody asks you what high school. I don't know if that's true of other cities. I don't know. 
Nick, are you from here? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, what high school did you go to? I, I grew up in Fenton, and okay. I went to Northwest House Springs, Missouri. Shout out to Jeff Go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. So this is special too. We have um, a studio audience, which if you've listened to Now That's Something Good, you know, I love when we get to have other people in the room. It's just fun. So we have Angie's husband, Nathan, and Nick's wife, Sue, in here too. So you might hear them a little bit in the background when we hold up the applause or laugh or they're they're helping us go on here. Okay, let's just get after it. So Angie and Nick, this is, you guys are both going to share a story, but Angie, it really kind of starts with you. So can you just take us back? Where does this whole health journey, everything start for you? Um, so when I was 29, I uh, was diagnosed with a kidney disease. It's supposed to be a genetic disease, although no one else in my family has ever been diagnosed. Wow. So I'm a special special case, a mutant, <laughs> a mutant. Um, <laughs> you might say. And so I was diagnosed and um, I just had a kidney infection and they checked it further and found the uh, polycystic kidney disease. Okay. So from that time, it really didn't affect my life a lot until um, I was in my later 30s. I just went to the doctor and got checked every year and things were kind of holding steady. Yeah. Um, it, I had to be with a high risk doctor when I had Josie. Okay. Um, I already had the two boys before I was diagnosed with kidney disease. So it was a little bit of a discussion whether or not I would have a third child. Um, and we did, and we're so glad we did. (laughs) Um, and then when I was in my late thirties, my kidney function started to fall and it was getting, um, closer to the point where they realized that I was going to have to have a transplant, uh, Earlier on, a lot of people would ask me, like, well, should we start getting tested? But the insurance companies don't pay to get tested until you actually need a transplant. Okay. So as time went on, uh, it got to the point in April, March, in March of 2016, uh, they decided it was time to start getting the transplant work up. Okay. And we started down that road at that time. And... uh It was really nerve wracking because I had a senior in high school and uh, he was going to graduate and go to college. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, okay, I have to deal with these health issues. Yeah. So Angie, take us back for a second because when you're 29 and you have two young kids, like you said, and you're getting this diagnosis in the first place, like what were you, what was your headspace like back then? Was it scary? Was it just, hey, this is a thing? How, How were you really feeling and thinking all of that through back then? It was a scary time and to get the diagnosis was nerve wracking, but honestly, I tend to spaz out more about little details okay. uh, that are meaningless <laughs> than a major health issue. So um, that's probably, I mean, my that's grandpa <laughs> was diagnosed later with cancer and I went into like appointment mode, like, yeah. okay, what are we going to do? What do we need to do to make sure he's taken care of? And that's the way I kind of am with everything. With my kids, if something major happens, I'm just thinking and getting things done. Yeah. But then if they wear the wrong color shirt and we clash at church, then I'm going to be like really nervous about that. I I love that. We wear the wrong. That's the big deal. I love love that. Please, if you go to our church and you're Angie, we get to go to church with them. And so it's fun. If you see them in there, don't point out if the shirts don't all coordinate. Yeah, it'll stress me out. I won't be able to focus at all. That's good. I love that. I love that. Angie, I don't know anything about being freaking out about small details, so <laughs> you're all by yourself. No, yes. I, I think a lot of people will relate to that. So walk, okay, so you found this out. You still have little kids. You're walking this. You said it wasn't impacting much of your everyday life. Were you having to get checks or go I to the doctor? went to the doctor or, uh, once every six months. Okay. and um, But it, once that initial kidney infection was treated and... I was past that, then it didn't really affect my life on the day to day. Okay. Um, I continued to work and um, just live life with little kids and go about my business until later. And when I was in my later 30s, I started to feel tired. That was my biggest uh, side effect was that I was really tired. And even then, when it got to the point where I was on the transplant list, I didn't realize how low functioning I had become. Because it happened so gradually. So everybody knew that I took a nap in the afternoon and that was just what I did. Yeah. But then as it got closer to the time of transplant, it was at the point where I was going to work, coming home, taking a nap, maybe going to one of the kids' games or something in the evening and then back to bed. Okay. And at the very end, right toward the transplant, I was sleeping 
you know, maybe 16 hours a day yeah. and like barely doing anything else. But because it came on so slowly, I didn't recognize what a huge impact it was having until after the transplant. And then I felt so much better. It was like, wow, this is a huge difference. I bet. I bet. How much, how long were you on the transplant list? So they told me in March that I needed a transplant. Um, My insurance would cover a workup for five people. And so family and friends uh, okay, and agreed to be just, tested. Okay, so just make give us some of the, because some of us don't, I, I don't know a lot of these details. So work up, that's meaning you're trying to find somebody yes. who can match to be a kidney yes. donor. Yes, so the initial testing is uh, primarily blood work. Okay. And then they'll do like an EKG and a chest x-ray and further testing closer to transplant time, but it starts off with blood work, okay. a lot of blood work. Okay. Um. So I had five people who had agreed to do that. And so on uh, May 5th, 2016, we, uh, a group of us tromped down to downtown Barnes. Mm -hmm. I also used to be very opposed to driving across the river. I like to know my surroundings and that was in St. Charles County. So I didn't make a lot of trips across the river. And so going downtown was like a big deal to me. Uh, So we did that on um, May 5th and it was Nathan and I and Nick And a couple of my nurse friends who were kind of overseeing things to make sure that we asked the right questions and uh, that I didn't freak out about any of the testing. Yeah. Um, My sister went, I think that was it. Um, Okay. But I should back up because before we got to that day. Yeah. um, So my sister, two of my sisters um, agreed to be tested. One of them was um, knocked out of that early on because of some medication that she took. Um, I have another sister who is a single mom in Wisconsin. And so I was like, no, we're not going down that road that you have other things to deal with. Um, And so we were talking about who was going to get tested and stuff. Nathan was going to get tested. And then one night, uh, Nick (laughs) messaged me. I had posted it on Facebook because, of course, where do you start with I need an organ, right? social media. Right. Hey, so as one should. <laughs> <laughs> so I had posted it on social media. Nick and I had been friends and we were in small groups together for years prior to this. Um, and then when he messaged me and he said, I just saw your post on Facebook. I really didn't know that you had this going on. Um, but I kind of am feeling like maybe I should get tested. And I laughed and laughed (laughs) (laughs) because Nick can't stand to get blood work taken without passing out, literally. Okay, so Nick, I feel like we need to jump to you for a minute because this you guys listening are going to figure out the connection here. This is why Angie and Nick are here and they're going to keep sharing the story. But Nick, catch us up. So Angie just was sharing that in that time. Tell us what's going on in your world and then tell us about seeing the Facebook post and all that. So I I, hit the time, I was just going a mile a minute with work, working full time, and I would be called out every any given moment of my body. I was always exhausted. It in a different like, career. Yeah, a different okay. career prior to okay. being in SPED. And then and and I did notice that post that she had and I was like, gosh, this is crazy. But I I just I felt something that said, hey, you need to do this. But on that flip side, I knew I had an issue with going into any medical facility. I get yeah. this white coat phobia and I start to black out, get a cold sweat. And OK, yeah, fall over. fair enough. Yeah. So um, I did agree to get this testing done. And we, we I went in for the testing, the round that she was referring to where everybody yeah. was sitting down. They were all sitting there listening, and I started just listening to it, and I started getting queasy. So I had to leave. I didn't even listen to any of the stuff. I oh, went Nick, out and sat in the is... waiting or like the waiting area and just waited until okay. it was over. And then I was, it was, it's like, oh, you know, I'll get knocked out probably, you know, because I wasn't the most healthiest <laughs> specimen yeah. they probably had <laughs> walked through their door, <laughs> you know. So that's great. Yeah, I ended up going through that and doing that testing, and then. Um, it just progressed through there as far as the testing, and okay. I, um, they had more and more rounds of testing. And like she said, the blood work, they make the most, uh, they, they make you go through the most intensive testing that I've ever experienced. They test for everything. Okay. They test, they do imaging, make sure I'm not going to have problems down the road. Um, they, they just, there's so many th- Things that you have to go through to make sure yeah. you're not, you know, you're not only you're going to be healthy, but, it, you know, the kidney is going to be beneficial for the, the recipient. Yeah. So I 
I don't know anything really about the world of transplants than just little things you've read, you know, watching Grey's Anatomy or something, you know, all the things you learn <laughs> on the medical TV dramas that I'm sure is very realistic and true. Um, tell, I mean, what, what do you need to have? What's just the basic? Cause you have two kidneys and you can then I'm guess you can live with one kidney. So both of your kidneys, Angie, were come back to that. Were, were you needing both kidneys? So because my kidney function was dropping, it was around um, 19% whenever we started the process and then 12% kidney function whenever we had the surgery. Wow. Um, and so that was combined. And then with, when they do a transplant, they leave your old kidneys in. Okay. And they just put a new one kind of in the front of your stomach. Um, okay. Rather your old kid, your native kidneys are in the back. Okay. And so just what, I mean, so you're talking about this testing and it is intrusive because you really do need to make sure it's compatible on all of the levels. How long did that testing process take? It start. We started in May, and then um, my part of the testing. I was officially listed on the transplant list in July. Okay, and then Nick continued to do testing, and he called me at the end of July to say that he was approved and that we would be getting a date. I was in the airport and by myself, flying to meet my family somewhere, and he called and told me, and I was like in the line crying, and I say to strangers, "My friend's going to give me a kidney." <laughs> <laughs> and they look at me like I'm crazy, but of course I just was like, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Okay. So Nick, back us up. So you're doing this testing, which is a big deal, obviously because of the medical things anyway, but what are you thinking and feeling during this time? Because it's one thing to go, you know what, I'll just go figure this out. And then they're like, Hey, you keep getting through the testing and it's like, Hey, this is going to happen. You know, so that's, that's an interesting question. Cause so really what <laughs> I've never experienced signs or callings or anything. Yeah. I grew up in a Catholic church and then, you know, I, I kind of strayed away from that as, you know, as I was getting older yeah. and then, Anyway, it, I started getting these things. I felt like I felt almost like it was a calling, like signs. I, and then people think I'm crazy. That's probably no, why they yeah. did a psych evaluation on me. They wanted to check. <laughs> Seriously, they had to That's bring. That's great. They, had they to do bring that on everybody. A, but a okay. Okay. His Thank may you, have been Look, longer. See, did you hear? They do it on everybody, Nick. So it wasn't just you. That's yeah. Good. So they ended up. Um, Doing all these tests, but um, where was I going with that? <laughs> the signs. Yeah, oh, yeah. Talk about, yeah. Okay. I, there's so much information that I'm trying, trying to process all of it. Anyway, yeah. there's so I, I had this little key. I ride a motorcycle and my little okay. my little keychain said donate life. It was from the license bureau. So the one of the days that she she told me that she got on a transplant list was, a, I believe it was on a Thursday. I went to St. Charles Harley Davidson. I had my motorcycle parked there and a guy. Hmm comes up to me and said, hey, would you like to go on a benefit ride for my son, Tristan? He just got done having a kidney, um, he just got done having a kidney transplant and he, um, we're doing a benefit ride for wow. him. I was like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And my friend was with him. I said, you know, it's really weird. He's like, what's that? I said, I just got approved to be a donor that it was that, that day. Um, after the the testing and, and that some it just the signs pointed one thing to another. So when she told me that day that she had um, that she was getting approved for or yeah for approved for the list, it was just like one thing after another. I was driving down the highway, had the billboard that ended up saying uh, consider organ donation, you know, or uh, <laughs> you know for the state of Missouri. And then the yeah. next day it was what I got my license renewed, and they said, "Do you want to be a licensed or a organ donor?" Um, we were in Piedmont, Missouri, driving some back roads with my wife's family, and there's an old church there, and it said, consider or, um, organ donation, give your heart to Jesus, you know? Wow. It was just one thing after another. Yeah. And I just felt like everything was pointing me into their things, popping up on Facebook all, all the time, just their thing. I mean, just all these, everything led yeah. me to continue on, and it, I felt as long as the the testing was positive and continued to give good results and my body was able to do it. There was no reason why I couldn't. That's amazing. I love that. And you could chalk those little things up to being coincidences or 
I mean, we believe that's God, right? Orchestrating things, showing things, kind of paving the way, going, hey, this is the right thing and this is what you need to do. And and that's amazing. I love, I love to hear that. Angie, walk us through that time for you, just that while everybody's getting tested, how are you feeling? I'm sure you were having a lot of thoughts and emotions. I mean, one, you're not feeling as well anymore. So it's just the physical sides. How are you feeling emotionally, mentally, spiritually walking through that time? Um, it was kind of crazy because... I found out that I needed to have the transplant on a Thursday, and then my uncle died on that Sunday Mm -hmm. of it. He was in an accident. And so that, like, took a lot of my focus, and it was really, it was a family member that I was close to. And then his family, his wife and kids, decided that they were going to do his memorials. They wanted to have donated to part of to help pay for the expenses of the transplant. Wow. And so that was really overwhelming. And um, while I totally don't feel like God took my uncle to for this, right. it just was a piece of the puzzle that we didn't know how much things were going to cost and how we were going to pay for it. And that was a huge a hu- impact. Yeah. And then, like, moving forward from that, I really had a piece. Um, uh, initially, the first day that I find, found out that I needed the transplant, I kind of freaked out a bit. Yeah. But I, it wasn't, I wasn't super emotional. Um, and I have some depression in my past, but I didn't like go into a depression where yeah. I was hiding or, you know, I would, whenever I had plans with friends or family, I would take a nap that day and I would go out and go about my business. And yeah. Sue and I happened to be on a girl's trip. Um, before we started the workup process in May, but after I knew that I needed the transplant and, you know, she was like, wow, I didn't realize how much this was affecting your life. And Mm -hmm. until we were together for a few days at a time. Yeah. Um, also something that Nick didn't mention, um, when he was talking about the process in his mind was that Sue, uh, found out that she was going to be losing her job at the end of August. Mm -hmm. And they didn't tell me that Nick (laughs) <laughs> when he was going through the workup, didn't know that his company was going to pay for him to be off. And so they okay. just had faith and proceeded with everything without telling me because wow. I would not have wanted them to put their finances at risk. Yeah. Um, and they didn't tell me. They just had faith that it was going to work out. Mm. And we all continued on. And it ended up that um, Sue got another job that was great, a great fit mm. for her at that time. And... um at the end, after the transplant, Nick ended up not going back to work, and it worked out great because that was a job that wasn't a great fit for their family anymore. Yeah. Um, initially, when I said to Sue, like, Nick's talking about getting worked up for this. How do you feel about that? Are you yeah. okay with it? Yeah. And she said, if this is something that God can use to get him out of this job, then well, I'm, I'm all in favor. If God can use him, then I'm on board. That's- and, you know, to have the support of friends that much was really um unbelievable yeah and from that point and moving on and you know nathan it our family had just kind of changed to the point where i was sleeping a lot and nathan Mm -hmm. was taking care of a lot Mm -hmm. and um he's always been a great dad and during that time he was a great dad and he just continued to take care of what he needed to take care of yeah and um a lot of people outside of our house didn't realize how much things had changed. Right. So Angie, how were your, talk about the kids. So, I mean, this has been a little bit of time now and we're going to talk about that number in a minute, but what was, your kids would have all been still, what, high school? Josie would have probably been, she's still been in elementary school uh, or middle She school? was I, in elementary school, I think. <clears throat> Let's see. She's a junior now. So she was in sixth grade. Okay. so And so Josie was in middle school. Jeremy and Jay were both in high school. And um, really, that's where I put my focus. So I they definitely knew or experienced my fatigue. And yeah. they knew yeah. that I wasn't um, doing as much as I had before. But what I what energy I had, I kind of put into them. Yeah. So, you know, Jay would come home at night with his friends at 10 o'clock and... I maybe would have napped while they were gone and then I would get up and make snacks or, uh, you know, Jeremy had games and well, both the boys played baseball, Josie played softball and I didn't miss their events unless there was like, I was just totally wiped out and couldn't do it. But that's what I did was, um, worked 
and went to the kids' events Okay, for the most part. Okay. And still had some girls' nights, which... I'm sure got you me through. It, yeah, <laughs> to just kind of get you get you through. So you get the phone call in the airport. When what what month was when was that? July. Okay. Um, and it's how how fast was it? I mean, how much did they move at that point? So you. So they said, okay, Nick's the match. Um, he's gonna <clears throat> donate. Um, but it still took a little bit of time. Uh. I think, did you have to meet, meet with like a dietitian so, or something? He met with some I other had, people. Yeah, I had to meet with a couple other people. And then we had to, I had to pick a, so one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is, so when when this whole process gets started, she's assigned yeah. a coordinator and I'm assigned a coordinator. And at any given time where I feel like I want to stop the process, they'll sell, tell her something, hey, this process is stopped. Even if I made everything fine, you know, like all the testing came out positive and I just wanted to stop, they would tell, make something up, yeah. tell, you know, say, yeah. hey, he didn't pass this test, so we have to stop and move on, look for somebody else. But yeah, um, I was assigned uh, the... Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's all right. You're doing good. I was You're assi- doing good. assigned this, the coordinator, and then they can um, they help out dramatically okay. on on everything as far as guiding you and yeah. and letting you know what what you need and and don't need. Okay. So, so what did your prep look like for, on your end leading up to the transplant? Uh, the biggest thing I had to do was. And I did this before, and that's what's kind of odd. When she posted that on Facebook, I, re- I remember her posting, made this post. I just looked at it prior to getting here. It was like April 22nd. She said mm-hmm. something along the lines, oh, I hope hope somebody gets approved for this. And I said, don't worry. It's already taken care of. I, ha- I have it, and it's a screen. I usually I took screenshots and saved everything. That's awesome. So it was really, really neat to see that um, on the way here. But the, as far as prep, that I was, I started drinking like I was drinking sodas all the time. I had Coca Cola. I just drink, gosh, like a two liter a day. Then I started <laughs> for some reason. I just started drinking waters all the time, and I just I had this feeling in my body that hmm. I. I knew I was this going was to be approved. Happen. I don't know how or why. It was, it yeah. was weird. It's hard to explain. Yeah, it really wow. is. And when pe- I tell people it, they look at me like I'm crazy. If somebody would have told me <laughs> the same story, I would have said, you know, looked down like you're nuts and yeah. just kind of shook my head and said, yeah, that's awesome. Great. <laughs> you know, but yeah. Wow. So it, um, really, that that's the biggest thing I did that and just trying to walk and exercise and kind of keep up with myself and, and test just c- continued to come out. Wow. You know, in favor, even like the genetic testing, that's what was really weird. Like, because they do genetic tests, they do everything, as I yeah. was stating earlier. And and the DNA markers were just, you know, spot on. And it's just crazy. That, everything, everything just lined out perfectly. Really. Yeah. So, Angie, if, if I mean, I don't want to sit on this part for too long, but if one of the people you brought in for the workup would not have been a match, would you have gone on like the national... Mm-hmm. Transplant list. And I anybody. was on the transplant list okay. at the same time that they're doing that because time is passing and you're moving up the list yeah. as time goes on. Um, but if none of the first five would have passed and been a good donor, then they could have tested another five. Okay. And it's really heartbreaking because some people don't have anybody that steps up yeah. to be a, a donor option. And I was so fortunate because... I, I had five to be tested and I would have had another five after that. Wow. And um, it really blows my mind. And as time was going on, people were kind of like, you seem so calm about this. And I would say like, I don't, maybe I'm in, in denial, but I think I just have faith that mm-hmm. God's going to work this all out. And yeah. boy, did he, he really showed off. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Angie. So take us to, I mean, it's coming down, it's transplant day how does all what is your prep like what are they doing for you in those days leading up to the actual so I just did like a normal workup that you would do before surgery I got an EKG got a chest x-ray got the last minute blood work done okay um before I have any procedure I always get my hair in two French braids so that it's out of the way and so I got I feel like that's a great yeah (laughs) I got my hair braided and I went to bed that night before and um, Mike and Tina Perkle came over and prayed mm-hmm. with me. Um, and we went to bed and, you know, I told all my kids like, you know, I, I think that this is going to go well. I yeah. have faith that it's going to go well, but if it doesn't, obviously you'll be sad, but 
I'll be yeah. great because I'll be off to glory. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, I to- I didn't want them to worry, but but I told them that I would be <laughs> um, ready to go at that time. You know, whatever God had for me, I was uh, accepting of that. And yeah. um, so then we got up the next morning. Um, Nathan and I picked Nick up on our way to the hospital and we were going downtown. And um, so you they, guys rode in the car together. On we the way. did. I love this. And um, Nick's showing us pictures along the way. We're going to have to put. <laughs> we'll post these for everybody to see. I love it. We'll. And the uh, the song "Oceans" was on huh. on our way, and I was listening to the words to that and really feeling like God was definitely taking me deeper yeah. than I would have thought. At, but that I was, I was at peace about it. I wasn't really nervous. And wow. uh, then we got off at the exit and we were running a little bit late <laughs> and Nathan wanted to stop at the stoplight for a while and take some pictures. And Nick and I were starting to get a little bit like, let's go. We got to get there on time. We don't want to miss our surgery slot. <laughs> and then we, we don't want to, this is kind of a big deal. <laughs> right. Right. Well, maybe we can take pictures another time. <laughs> and you got to so, document it. That's, that's right. Good. And so um, we got there and went into surgery. And it was, you know, everything went well. I was in my room first and they were like, you know, Nick's um, going in. They're going to do, they're going to do the incision. They'll get the kidney out and then they'll take you back and get you ready. Wow. And so How that's long what happened. The whole, from Nick, from you going in to you coming out, and how long was the... Yeah, Nick wow. and I'm um, Nathan and Sue probably have a better idea of that part, but I think it was like maybe five hours from the time he started till he till I was back out. Okay, okay. Because one minute you're here, the next minute you know everything's black, and then you're awake again. And yeah, that's the only thing you know. And then you're like, oh wow, I have a little itch on my side, and then <laughs> you know, and yeah, Nick. How okay? So all the medical things. I mean. It's one thing to get blood work drawn. It's a whole other thing to have to go under and have surgery. How were you? Were you doing okay on that day? How were you feeling about well, everything? Well, as, as I was show, showing you the pitch, we we're coming up at the escalator, <laughs> and that was the only time when Nathan said, "Stop for a selfie." We're, we're stopped. <laughs> and we st- I'll look, and and he it. turns back, and I, I he's snapping a picture, and then I was like, "Oh, this is I'm really doing this," you know, kind of mm. setting in. Yeah, that was the only time I ever really thought, "Oh my gosh, what am I doing?" But <laughs> how did I get here? It's kind of probably too late to back out at that point. Yeah, <laughs> but, but you know, it, it, here's when I'm asked about it: Why did you do, or why would you? Why would anybody do something like that? You know, it's yeah. kind of for me personally. It's like watching a you know, seeing a kid get ready to run in front of a car. Mm-hmm. If I don't run out there and make an attempt to stop, you know, stop, yeah. it's just it, for me. It was a no brainer. I, I had to tr- make an attempt to try helping out, and if I didn't, I, I would have. I I think I'd live with regret at knowing if something would have happened to her. So yeah, I'm um, going in there. Um, that that wasn't that big a deal. I just I wasn't scared on the surgery part of it because, yeah. uh, like I said, when I met the I met went to the benefit for that boy I was referring yeah. to earlier, yeah. Tristan. I went to his benefit and I and I talked to him a while and I said, hey, buddy. He, he was like, I think twelve or thirteen at the time. Mm-hmm. I said, hey, Tristan. I said, what was What's it like to go through surgery? Because I haven't had it since I was, you know, a kid that, you know, toddler. And uh, he said, he goes, you just go in there and they put the IV in, then you wake up and it's done. Hmm. I was like, well, I can do that. (laughs) You know, so. That's great. I went ahead and, and took that and, and all the, you know, things that I experienced and, and I just ran with it, and I, I knew it was definitely something that I, I had to go through with. Yeah. So. So when you woke up, what was recovery like for you on your end, being um, the donor? It really, it wasn't. Here's what the the worst part was: they were going to come up and they were wanting to give me shots, okay. and I'm like, I don't want a shot because they said I had to do something to keep my legs from. They're like, either you have to get out of this bed and start walking, or we're going to give you an injection. I'm like, well, can't you give it through the IV? No, we have to give it to you in the leg or thigh <laughs> or something. I'm like, uh-uh, I don't want to feel a needle, you know? So 
<laughs> I know. It's just I love that so much. You just gave a so, kidney, but can't get no, no shot. I know. So <laughs> well, that's that's another story. The, the, the blood work was a, a story in itself. I, I had three people over me. so it's, Well, Nick, I feel like you're um, going to tell the story now because I am yeah, a little intrigued by this. But, well, like, it's great. Did you pass out with the blood? Well, mm-hmm. Okay. So back, this is prior to, uh, this is during testing. So just, um, so I go into this lady um, named Pam. <laughs> And Pam is just phenomenal phlebotomist down there at Barnes. Seriously, okay, it, she really is. Yeah. And so she, they had to do 16 vials of blood. 16? Uh, yeah, 16. So I'm sitting in there oh, no. and I, I hear them clinking into the rack and I'm counting those mentally in my head. And I get through like the first four and I'm, I'm starting to get sinking in the chair lower and lower. Oh, no. So... I start getting this cold sweat over me. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then everything starts to gray out. And they're, and I hear this one girl say, we're starting to lose. Them. We're starting to lose. Them. And we and can then, hear that down the hall as yeah, well. And this other one, the other girl's going, yeah, he's gone, honey. He's gone. And then this other one goes, I hear somebody say, get a, get a cloth, get a cloth. And then. They bring some an orange juice over, and they're like, "Should we keep on going?" I said, "Just keep on going into and, and I and I don't know if I'm. I guess I made it or something. I don't know if I had to do them over or what. But it was so embarrassing. So I felt bad. I next time I went down there and get blood, I gave the lady a Starbucks card because I know it that's, was. Uh, you well, did that day. You pull out your wallet yeah, and you're right. like, "Oh, what do one. I have?" That's in here. right. Okay, let me here take that's this right. gift card. I'm so sorry. That's right. <laughs> That's it, was, it was so embarrassing, that yeah, whole, I, you know, I, I mean, seriously, when you're sitting there trying to do it and you're like, and they're like, and then she's like, honey, you're going to give yourself and give somebody a kidney and you can't even do blood work. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. So that's fun. yeah, that, it's so that it was a experience in itself, the yeah, blood work, yeah. but, um, I'm no, sure you're was, not the only person that's ever passed out or had a hard time in yeah. a blood, blood draw. So, yeah. But, and then after that, really, um, back to like the. After the surgery, um, I, I got up. That was incentive. That injection was going to be enough incentive for me to get out of bed. Okay. And I did that. I had a thing called a, a pain pump that they put on the side of me. And they, it worked phenomenal. It great. Wow. Until Uh-oh. night and the lady, the nurse didn't know how to change the pain pump capsules or whatever they go in their cartridges oh no and oh my gosh that's and then they pulled pulled that thing off and i had a reaction to the the uh tape oh the 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 adhesive in in the tape and that that was probably the that hurt bad when they pulled that off wow but other than that i don't regret anything i think the 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 best part and and i usually tear up every time i think about it is coming down and seeing her walking down the hall Hmm. and seeing you get it up for the first time and saying how you, how you didn't have pain <laughs> and you could you felt like you had energy you were like wide awake and so excited <laughs> and to see that was just i mean it was priceless it, it took any you know it made everything worthwhile i love that nick that's that's cool so angie you go in <laughs> they get you under you wake up pick up from there what nick the story how are you feeling when you wake up and come to and Um, so I woke up and I felt good going for months prior to my transplant. I was having this terrible foot pain Mm. and I didn't think it was related. Um, but then as soon as I got out of bed for the first time, the foot pain was gone. And so I thought it was like plantar fasciitis or whatever, but it turned out that it was just toxin built up that the kidney wasn't taken care of like it was supposed to. And so the foot pain was gone as soon as I got up from the surgery Um, and they initially had said that I was going to stay in for five days and I was like, no, I'm going to need to get home Sunday night because my son needs to go back to college and it'll just be better if I'm home. And so, uh, I think Nick got out on Saturday. I got out on Sunday, but recovery from that really wasn't terrible. Um, you know, there was some pain, but it wasn't awful. And the fact that I just felt so much better made it easy to deal with. Um, and just that I couldn't believe how smoothly things went in the scheme of needing a transplant. Um, things went so smoothly. It was just unbelievable. I love it. So Angie, what day was that and what anniversary are you getting ready to celebrate? 
That was October 13th, 2016, and uh, we're coming up on our five-year anniversary. That is amazing. That's definitely something good for the for the title. That's Absolutely. Amazing. So, and the cool thing is you guys listening to this podcast episode, if you're listening to it on the day it comes out, it is actually the five-year anniversary, which is crazy on the timing. Angie actually came up to me at church. We we all get to go to the same church together. Angie was like, hey, I've got to tell you, it's coming up on the five-year anniversary, and I, can we could we share that story? I was like... A hundred percent. That would be amazing. And how cool that it's coming up on the five year anniversary. So walk us through the last five years. You, you're, you seem like you're doing great, Angie. Yeah, Tell us. I am doing great. Um, <clears throat> two years, let's see, two years after the surgery, I went in and had my native kidneys removed because as time goes on, they continued to grow. Okay. And um, so they started causing some problems with shortness of breath and such because everything was just getting too crowded in my abdomen. Yeah. I'm a short girl and there wasn't a lot of space for enormous kidneys and everything else. Yeah. And so I got those removed. And since then, I just felt better and better. Um, I tease Nathan that I'm aging in reverse and that um, <laughs> he's aging faster than me. <laughs> he disagrees. That's great. But... Um, <laughs> I, I feel really good, and in that five years, I two of my kids have graduated, and um, Jay got married, and we just have had some fantastic family memories. Um, yeah. It's really fun to have older kids, and I love it. I love every time that we're all six around the table together, yeah. and um, every moment that I get to spend with my family, I don't take it for granted mm-hmm. um, I like I would if... Yeah. This hadn't all happened. And um, God showed himself to me in huge ways. Um, I didn't feel really nervous going into the transplant yeah. because I I just felt the peace of the Lord. And I can't imagine going through it without that. But, you know, every step of the way, God showed himself just in unbelievable ways that you couldn't even imagine, mm-hmm. um, you know, when Nick was talking about all the signs, one of the first things he told me was, I, I read your post on Facebook and I started thinking about it. And I was then later I was eating dinner and Susan had made some soup and I looked down and there was a kidney bean. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's things just amazing. started off in the smallest ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but God just proved himself to be so real. Mm-hmm. And I've been a Christian um, for most of my life since I was five years old. Uh, yeah. But going through something like this and... Um, being surrounded by my community from church and friends and family that have always been there for me, but like this is really being there. Yeah. Um, One of the things that I wanted to kind of touch on was that I'm kind of a caregiver. I work in healthcare and in my family, that's kind of my role. Like I just want to take care of people. And I just told um, my daughter yesterday, like feeding is love. Like I want to cook for you and your friends and that makes me happy. And so that's kind of who I am is... I just am a caregiver. Like I keep track of everybody's schedule and stuff. But then during this time, I needed to receive care. And that was, that part was really probably the hardest thing for me was like sitting back and Mm. receiving care instead of trying to take care of it. Even after I first came out of anesthesia, um, I kept wanting to like, literally when I first came out of anesthesia, I was telling a couple of my friends, I wanted to get them some snacks. Like, (laughs) And for some reason, I was swearing and saying words that I don't usually say. And I was saying, I just want to, I just want to get you guys a snack. And I, and they were like, it's, you're fine. Just rest. You just Mm. need to rest. And I was like, I need to get you a snack. (laughs) This is so crazy. And so um, people brought us meals. They set up a meal train, which was amazing. And that's another detail that um, just proved that God was there because one of the on my son's birthday, um, somebody brought one of his favorite meals for dinner and they didn't know. Oh. And it just worked out great um, that he was taken care of in yeah. that way. Yeah. And um, and just receiving that care. And so I just would like to encourage everybody that sometimes when you're going through things, um, giving care or receiving the care is hard because mm-hmm. everybody says, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? But really, it's a gift to other people to let them do that because um, because you need it. And there's times that we need rest and, and yeah. other people can feel good about blessing you. And so no matter how hard yeah. it is, um, be honest and just let people know what you need. Angie, that's so good because I think 
so many people will resonate with that. They, they're they happy to jump in and help other people, but when it comes to them, they either don't want to share what's going on or... It, um, and I had a dear friend years ago, we had a situation, our house, our house flooded, we needed some help, and I'm a, not so much a caretaker as a just get it done, do all the things, I've got it, we're fine, I don't want to be a burden to anybody else is what it feels like. And they just looked at me and said, hey, by you not letting other people help, you are robbing them of a blessing and what God might want to do in their life. And that has stuck with me ever since because I was like, you know what? People, God needs to use everybody and it's allowing them to be a part. And sometimes it's really just, you know, pride on my part of like, man, things can go on without me and let somebody else take care of you. And that's how God wants to use them. And it's a blessing to you and it's a blessing to them. And it, but it's, it's hard to do. Nick, talk to us in five years. How are you? How are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm feeling really good. So uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting is when when all this the transplants going on, a lot of people don't realize. I just I'm kind of looking through pictures to help refresh my mind. Yeah. It's kind of kind of ADHD thing with me, but. Um, looking at the pictures of the number of people that are in each operating room, hmm. I'm looking at a picture and there were 14 people that were in, in, in an OR. And then, cause I guess they have to add multiple, you know, like an extra doctor or something, an okay. extra anesthesiologist, all this. Yeah. But um, looking at some of these things and, and to see where, what happens after the surgery is, is interesting. So when she gets that kidney, my new kidney in her and it starts working your body has now i have a single kidney and mm-hmm. well you have a single kidney i guess now right yep so <laughs> you got a pair between the both of you yeah so <laughs> what ends up happening is your kidney starts enlarging itself to make up for okay the lack of having an uh, you know one missing yeah and it it does it does the extra work of, of filtering and things so it, it's really interesting to see that so it took about it took exactly almost three months uh, on the dot for me to start feeling better whereas angie felt right a lot better right off the get-go because it yeah. started filtering working for her mine had a lack thereof, I guess you'd yeah. say, of the ability to filter blood. So it was like, hey, what's going on here? And I felt lethargic. I was tired. I was like, oh, my God, what's going on, you know? Yeah. So it did. It took about three months, and then all of a sudden I started feeling better and rebounded, and and I don't have any any issues or feelings from that now. I mean, yeah. I, I couldn't tell, Yeah. you know, now except for a little small incision on the, my side that or, you know, scar. But, yeah. Nothing, nothing bad. That's all. amazing. Angie, what would you tell somebody listening who's just, you talked a lot about the piece and I, I can hear it in your voice. Um, and of course that was a really scary situation, hard situation. What would you tell someone right now who's listening and maybe going through something similar, just a hard situation, a relationship, anything about just having peace and faith in the middle of that? Because we can say that, but it's hard to live that out. Can you just talk about that or say something to them listening? Um, I would say that whenever you're going through a struggle, look back in your past at the times that God has been faithful Mm -hmm. and because the devil's a liar and he will try to make you feel doubt and worry and fear. And whenever I start to feel those things now, I can look back on this time of my life that God was so Mm -hmm. close. And after my surgery, I even went through you know, probably three or six months later, I went through a period where I felt like, oh man, what's going on? Like, I don't feel so close to God, but it was just different. He didn't move. Of course he was right there, but things were just different. I didn't have to rely on him so heavily. Um, and it was just a different season of time for me. Um, but when I, anytime that something happens now, I can look back and see like God was so faithful. He never, was away from us at all. Every detail was within his, um, is within his plan and he had it all so worked out for our good before it all began. And there were ways that, um, even though I think that Nick is a hero and that he did so much for our family, um, but then there were ways that they were blessed from what he did, Mm -hmm. that God, uh, yeah, his life cha- like life changing his, for me. His yeah. job changed, yeah. and that changed his their whole fa- family dynamic for a while. And I just feel like um, God had it all worked out mm. for good. And yeah, um, that's how it is with every situation for every person. It might not 
it may not go as smoothly as you like. And um, there's times now that things don't go as smoothly as I like, but I can look at this story and be reminded that God is always faithful. I love, I love that, Angie. Nick, you said some things have changed. What, what have you kind of learned about the faithfulness or the goodness of God now through this experience that maybe you didn't know beforehand? You, you, that's a, a perfect question. So it, it completely changed my whole thought. Um, I, a lot of people tend to tend to get into their work environment and sit there and think, you know, I need to make more money. Oh, if mm-hmm. I had more money, this and that, this and that, more money, work, work harder. And I was working super hard at the time, okay. making decent money. Yeah. But I didn't get to see my family at all. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really enjoy anything that I'd get to do when I was off. I didn't get, I'd go on vacation. I was like, oh, Monday's coming around again. Yeah. So, and it's, it was just a mile a minute all the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, my work that I was currently, or that I was at prior to where we're at now, it was, um, I was in the uh, petroleum industry and okay. they they really thought it was going to be a quick turnaround, like it would be a week or two and I would be back. And and I told them, I said, hey, I need a little bit longer recovery. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's sore because I had a, a procedure done that one of the doctors there specialized and he actually was the developer innovator or whatever oh, wow. of that surgery. So wow. Barnes is, I can't say enough good things about Barnes, Yeah, but um, yeah, it was, the whole, the whole thing was just a blessing in itself. So I, I really learned that money isn't the, the goal, you mm-hmm. know, the whole thing in life um, that trying to be happy at a work environment is more rewarding to me, I guess. Okay. So, um, at the time I ended up going back into education and, um, first I started doing some volunteer work at okay. the elementary and then I started doing substitute teaching and then I went ahead and, and then got on, um, within the SPED department. Yeah. And, um, it, it, it was a lot, just, I'd go, come home at the end of the day and I didn't feel the stress or tension. It was really rewarding. And mm-hmm. I think that helps change your fi- family dynamics. Cause if you come home all the time upset, I'm sure you didn't like that. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so, so saying that it, it freed her up with the changes. Mm-hmm. It allowed her to be able to do some more things she wanted to do in her career and life too. So I think it put me, one of the things I really let go of was trying to control things in my life. Mm -hmm. And now I sit there and think, you know what, it's, it's in God's hands, seriously. And and as much as I try to plan stuff, because anytime I tried planning and doing it my way, it honestly never worked out Mm -hmm. or, you know, and it it frustrated me. Yeah. So it's now that's kind of. I know it's may frustrate you sometimes because it doesn't look like I have direction in my life at times, but I'm just on the ship and letting the sails. Yeah. You know, that's a cool place to be, Nick. And what a great lesson to learn because it's a false sense of control. Anyway, we don't, we don't really have the control. We just think that we do. And so to be in a spot where you can just really go open handed and go, Hey, every day is a gift. And what can we do today to glorify God and, love people. Um, I love that. Angie, so you did talk about, I want to touch on one other thing kind of here that it's a genetic condition that you have. And so you guys have since found out that, did you have all of the kids tested? Talk, talk about that a little bit. So back in 2019, uh, Josie was having some pain and we ended up having to go to the ER a couple of times. And initially they thought it was some kind of virus. And upon further testing, we found out that she also has polycystic kidney disease. Okay. And um, at that time, it was a struggle and uh, it's still a struggle to watch my daughter go through that. Mm-hmm. I would go through all of it again myself. Um to protect her from it. Mm -hmm. But also I, when I said we, you know, we kind of talked about having a third child and we weren't sure she is the greatest gift Mm -hmm. and she, um, completed our family and she is anybody that knows Josie knows that she's just a force to be reckoned with. (laughs) And she takes this into stride in a way that makes me so proud. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know what her future will look like and she's, she was diagnosed at 14 
um, whereas I wasn't diagnosed until I was almost 30. And she's having um, a lot of complications with it that I never had, even um, as my kidney function was failing. Her kidney function is fine, but she mm-hmm. has pain um, often. And that's something that we are dealing with. But she just um, takes it in stride. And I hope, my hope for her is that this helps her to lean on the Lord. Yeah. Um, and that my hope is that there will be some new inventions or innovations. There's um, testing yeah. for new portable kidneys or different things that might come out that hopefully before she would need a transplant, um, there will be something else available mm-hmm. for her. And uh, I pray that this doesn't affect her life in a terrible way, but I pray that she can remember what we went through and and know God's faithfulness yeah. all the time. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Angie. And if you guys are listening, I'm just going to make a plea. Pray pray for Josie. <laughs> pray for yeah. their family, yeah. for her health, and that God would just continue to work and move there. But Josie is, you You would never know. I mean, you just wouldn't know ever looking at her that anything is wrong. And we're just going to keep trusting that God's going to use that story in her, her life too. Um, if someone is interested in knowing more about being a donor, because part of the reason I think there's probably going to be someone listening to this story at some point in time might go, you know what? I would love to help. I, I could do something. Can, do you guys have information? And we can link all this in the show notes. You don't have to have the exact websites, but do, do you, either one of you just give some more information about that or what they could do to register? Or? There's a phone number um, that is like the case coordinators for uh, kidney transplants at Barnes Hospital. Okay. And um, we can link that. And then um, it just starts with some blood work and you know, you could be a donor to somebody that you don't know, or it may be that somebody that you know um, might have a need because over time I've come into contact with lots of people that, that do need a kidney yeah. or, um, you know, and definitely um, consider being an organ donor on your driver's license yeah. to talk to your yeah. family about that because yeah. your family ultimately gets to make that decision if there was some sort of accident or yes. something. That's good. Nick, can you talk about, I mean, you, you getting to be the donor, can you give some encouragement to anybody listening and maybe considering it or wanting to consider it? Definitely. I, I would agree with Angie on that. Um, one of the first things I would say is seeing different stories of people. I would um, encourage people to make sure that you, you are a donor on your driver's license, mm-hmm. that you have that checked off because um, the lo- the number of lives that you can save as far as um, just, I'm just on a site looking right now, the things, the tissues, I t- you know, eye tissue, skin, gra- you know, everything. There's so many different parts of um, a body that can be utilized for yeah. that. But um you can't. I went to. I think um, it was barn the barn site, and they have a um, living donor. You can fill out, and it, it'll link you up with a coordinator, okay. and they they will contact you and reach out. And and one of the things I always really say on that is, don't become discouraged because the testing process is lengthy. It's yeah. very lengthy. Okay. And and if they find they have a team that they present your case to so if when i went through uh, they gave to did all the blood work panels um uh imaging and whatnot and they provide um, put that in front of a panel of what's it 20 something doctors Mm -hmm. and then they present my case um and show them all the different um, test my blood work. They show all the doctors, all the, uh, the graphs. And if any one of those doctors, physicians, or radiologists, whatever they are, come up with a reason to, you know, say, hey, this isn't going to work, yeah. you know, or we may have a problem with this, then they'll knock you out of the running. Okay. So, and that's one of their jobs is to, they would rather do that than have you go through the procedure and then have something happen then you know, fingers come back to them. So yeah. um, it is it is a lengthy process, but I, I can tell you from experience, for me, it's one of the most rewarding things I've done. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it, it internally, it um, just makes you, it just changes you as a, as a person. It really does. I love um, it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I would definitely encourage everybody to definitely put at least that's a start. You're, yeah. you're the driver's license. No, that's great. We'll link that and we'll look for, I'm sure there may be some national databases for people who are not local. We'll mm-hmm. list all that in the show notes. So click on that. Um, is there anything, the time goes so fast. Is there anything that we've not talked about that you guys want to share or end with? I've got one last question before you go, but 
Anything else? Um, I just was thinking as he was talking about, uh, we were in a small group together many years ago at a different church, and that's how we met. And um, I love Facebook memories because things just pop up. But there was a memory that popped up where he said, like, I love my small group people, and I would do anything for them. And that <laughs> was like, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And then whenever I read that after our surgery, I was like, wow, he didn't, he really didn't know what anything was going to mean, did he? <laughs> and then we just got a new couple to our home team now um, mm-hmm. from Two Rivers. And we were like joking about, oh, what are you going to share? But we're going to share these things about ourselves so that you know everybody. And so Christian was like, um, to share your name, your family makeup, your history as a Christian, how long you've been at Two Rivers, um, and then, you know, share that. And then yeah. somebody jokes like, oh, and your social security number and your blood type. And then the new people, she says, what is, are we looking for an organ donor or something? And I was like, you don't, you don't know how true that can be. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. And it, it is That's- really sad because you do start seeing real quick, you know, on Facebook and, you know, social media is the thing. Yeah. Thing, and you see people that need it. And, and, and Angie hit the spot. I mean, when we went into that um, uh, over, what, what did they even call that? What, that we went into to see the... Like the education day? Yeah, there's a, like an education overview okay. of the procedure that I, I was supposed to listen to. That's the one I sat That's outside. That's you couldn't get. <laughs> yeah, so we were really supposed to listen to that. But it, it's sad to see... The families, like Angie said, um, that come in that do not have that support. And, you yeah. know, some of these people aren't going to make it. Yeah. And and to know and see the people that she had around her what was a blessing in itself. And, and just it's if amazing. anybody knows Angie, <laughs> that, that was another thing that helped me out is knowing what how caring she is and that she had a great family. Yeah. And, and for me, that was a no brainer if I could help do anything to prolong her life and and her family. So. Yeah, it was, it, it's been a, a blessing, I think, for both of us. Mm-hmm. And I don't think she realized how much it was going to impact my life or <laughs> long term, I guess, you know. I love that. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing the story. The last question, you guys have already shared so many good things, but the last question we ask everybody is just tell us something good. It can be anything. There's no qualifier. It could be another story. It could be a dad joke. It could be a product. Doesn't matter. I don't want to like anything, but share one last good thing with our listeners so we can all celebrate and look good together. Uh, For me, something good is just the everyday life. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, spending more time with my husband, uh, Today, we're looking forward to homecoming with my daughter. Yeah. Um, everything that my boys do, I think, is so funny. My daughter-in-law is just is a joy for our family. And um, just being around to to sit back and, and see it all happen is mm-hmm. something good for me. I love it. I just love um, being with my family. And when I get to spend a night with my girlfriends or, mm-hmm. you know, Whatever it is, I just, I really do enjoy life in a different way. I love that. Angie, I feel like since you like to take care of people and you said so many food things, do you have like a favorite, what's your go-to when you have a crowd full of uh, teens at your house? Um, what's your go-to snacks or food recipe? I well, feel like there's tonight something here. we're going to have some s'mores and okay. some cheese dip and chips. Um, this week I made a gooey butter cake for a funeral. Nice. Um, potato soup is an easy, quick fix. Yeah, I love it. People who doesn't love food. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy having people who like to cook food because food is not my love language. I mean, I like to receive food as a love language, but I am not the one that likes to cook it for people. So I like yeah. that. We need to be better it friends. It makes me Angie very happy when my kitchen's full and there's people around the table. Um, I love, love it. that. It's one of my favorite things. Love it. Nick, tell us something good. Um, I'm glad we're living in America. Um, did you know that that England doesn't have a um, a kidney bank? No. Yeah, but but they have a Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> you had me really going there for a second. No, I, that was great. Uh, That's great. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> I, the, the thing I I guess I and with with me is I I, I working with kids every day. I, mm. I think it just be kind. Love is love one another as much as you can and yeah. and do what's right and I think things will work out the way they mm-hmm. should. That's good. So. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness, I am still getting chills and tears coming to my eyes. 
just listening to, re- remembering the story that Nick and Angie shared. I so appreciated hearing their different perspectives and really am just encouraged and really challenged by the extraordinary act of kindness from Nick and really his, the support of his wife too as well, just being willing to donate a kidney to someone else in need. Extraordinary. I really hope today's episode encouraged you. If it did, again, I would recommend that you share this podcast with a friend. And if you can, rate and review our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Fantastic. For more information about our guests today, about uh, resources around the kidney disease that Angie has and the whole idea of becoming eligible to donate an organ, check out the show notes. Now, I do want to give you a special sneak peek that coming up soon, we're going to have a unique bonus episode where we get to hear from Angie's husband, Nathan, and from Nick's wife, Sue, about their perspective during this whole thing. So it's going to be a quick bonus episode, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And, you know, it, it upset him because after a couple of weeks, they're like, not how are you doing when you're coming back? Yeah. Mm, that, that was, That's hard. And Nick was like, I don't think I'm going back. And yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm thinking, he waited till this the, is your job. Like, yeah. you need to come back here. And yeah. I'm like, this is. He was on the last day of his 12 weeks of leave. And he was like, I, I don't think I can do it. And wow. I was like, you know what? Don't. Yeah. Do, we'll that's figure amazing. it out. Yeah. That's so. amazing, Sue. That's, that's really cool. Now that's something good. You totally should tune in to this episode. Where we explore the extraordinary in the everyday ordinary. Now that's something good. Hey, thank you again for listening to Now That's Something Good. On behalf of Sarah and the whole good family, we thank you. Now go and do something extraordinarily good today. It's in your power. You have control to do something good today. I hope you have fun and that you do good wherever you are today. Until next time, thanks for joining.